Thank you, Winton. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us at this important moment. I'm Matthias Tarnopolsky, President and CEO of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Tonight's event wasn't originally on our schedule, but we knew we needed to respond to the tragic and painful acts of racism, injustice and inequity, a culmination of decades of history of these past days and nights in the best way we know how through music and dialogue. I'm here with you from Philadelphia. We have Winton in New York, Yannick in Montreal. It's been a day of peaceful protest here in Philadelphia. Those of you joining us on Facebook, please let us know where you're joining us from. And if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them during the course of the next 40, 45 minutes. Thanks for being with us. Tonight's program is dedicated to the memories of George Floyd, Amor Darbery, Tony McDade, Breonna Taylor, and the countless black lives wrongfully and tragically lost before them, and to the value and dignity of all black lives. Joining us now is the music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra, my friend and partner, Yannick Nezesega. Hello, Matthias. This is indeed an important moment unimaginable for many of us. We're here today, here together, to ask questions. We do not yet have clear answers, but we need to ask questions. Indeed, Yannick, that's what today, that's what this evening's about. Uh, maybe not yet the time for healing, but definitely the time for questions. We are honored to have an incredible artist who opened our program tonight. He's an artist, a humanitarian. He's joining us for this conversation and contemplation. He is the artistic and managing director of jazz at Lincoln Center, a brilliant musician, humanist teacher and philosopher who welcomed us this evening with such soulful music, Winton Marsalis. Thanks for being with us, Winton. All right, Matthias, unique. It's a pleasure to be with y'all. And you know, I see, I know everybody's in a somber mood, but uh, for me, I, I'm, I'm in more of a jubilant mood. You know, it, it's, it's good that we look at these things and it's good that we protest uh, things and that we, that we, that we change our, our way of life. You know, music is about change. Uh, democracy gives us the opportunity to change. And then I see people around the world bringing attention to this same cause. And there are many causes on, on the planet Earth. This is a specific one that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, we need to do that. So yes, it's a serious subject. But it doesn't mean that we have to suspend the type of natural way we talk with each other. We've been knowing each other for many years. We've been friends for many years. You, you were just a little pup when you came over here. So, you know, it's, it's the same <laughs> amount of love and feeling I have for you. It, it's not any different. And uh, yeah. I, I'm glad that we're at this, at this moment in our country. I'm sorry about, of course, with COVID and all the different economic problems we have that are coming down the pipe. But this systemic injustice, it, it, it needs to stop because it it it. it it destroys the inner fabric and the, and the integrity of our democracy. And it makes us less as people. And in, in our country, this is the problem. But of course, as you all know, it's a problem in countries all over the world. Well, Winton, I mean, uh, you're playing opening and you're talking about somber mood, but also, you know, what music can generate and can convey as a mood. And it was so beautiful to hear you play. And now you're talking about music and all this. And often as musicians, we feel that music can seem almost powerless at this moment. But I would like to hear you on how can music speak specifically to this critical moment and to the generations of <clears throat> racial injustice? Well, music is pure consciousness. And our music is the art of the invisible. So if you have thoughts, emotions, memories, projections into the future, all things that lie in the realm of the invisible, music gets up in there and it nourishes us in that way. And there are music for many different circumstances. Like if you can remember that during the, during the, the American Civil War in the 19th century, um, my eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. And uh, Amazing Grace was written by a man who later became a, a staunch abolitionist of slavery. And then if we go to the 1960s and all the different protest songs that we had, those songs get inside of your soul and they're, they're songs of substance. And they're also pieces of substance, like 
John Coltrane's A Love Supreme or uh, Charles mm -hmm. Mingus's Fables of Fathers. And jazz musicians have been writing protest songs and music that, that brings us uh, closer to the root of, of, of problems. We have Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. So music is exactly what we need at this time to nourish our souls and to rise us, raise us to a, to a higher level of consciousness. Uh, Winston, these words are vitally important. I was struck by the, it was soulful, but it was also joyous how you opened, um, how you opened the program. And, you know, Yannick and I are thinking, like I said, thinking about the questions and we feel we just need to listen ever more deeply, both as an organization and as an interest, uh, as an, as an industry as well. And we need to chart a path to equity. We need to turn ideas into plans, plans into action. Um, so, you know, you also head up an institution. So how do you, you know, what questions uh, should we be thinking about? as individuals, as an institution, and as a society? Well, we, our institution started, I was there at the beginning of it. So we had three, three, three tenets, three basic things. One was uh, no segregation, no generation gap, and all of our music is modern. And you'll notice that this also, this, the protest that we're seeing around the world, at least in America I can speak to, it breaks down along lines of generation. I think that your, your real power in an institution is with your programming. When we sit down with our programming team, we talk about, do we have black people? Do we have white people? Do we have women? Uh, do we have, and when we first started, it was not a question of, of women. It was blacks and whites, old and young. And then in the last years, it's been, do we have enough women? Are we giving them opportunity? And I've always said that I believe in affirmative action. I don't believe in equality. Because I think that if you start behind, if you want to see your democracy work, I believe in a corrective assistance. And that's not a thing that has to be legislated. If I, if I know you're coming from a little longer distance, we all do it. If we teach in a class and we see a trumpet player, maybe it's not as advanced as other students. We don't hammer them. We start to treat them a different way. We come with another level of respect and care. And uh, I think our programming and uh, the way we deal with our staffs and the messages we send, uh, all of those things have to indicate a kind of worldliness and a sophistication that does not drag us into the old traditions that take us away from the type of future we envision. Um, Winston, you just talked about teaching and you, you, you said, you know, talking to students with with respect and care. And indeed, um, you and I and maybe you and Yannick also have been having a version of this conversation for uh, over two decades now. And it's great to, to do it with you with you live live here but i've also heard you say that when um you know you came from a school of teaching that was more about hard knocks than respect and care <laughs> right and and you had to change right, right? So, right. so you know how can you talk to us a bit about that journey because our whole society has to go through that journey and you know you're a musical intellectual leader in this particular subject how was your journey how did you change here well it's hard for me to change because i grew up in the in the time of black nationalism. And, I, you know, I was a brother. I had my Afro. I was, I was soulful. I was from the hood. My daddy I was a jazz musician. He was struggling. But my father was always a, a, a humanist. So through the 70s, I sat in barbershop after barbershop with him defending uh, humanism and, and white people back when that was not the vibe. Uh, we have been victims of so much racism. And I mean, for me, I can't, I'm not even going to go into my personal story because there's, uh, there are many stories. But I took it very hard. And it took me... Uh, up until I was in my mid-20s, until I could actually listen to enough of the, the, the wiser of the elders who were saying, you can't solve the problem of sectarianism and tribalism by being a tribalist. And then it was hard because a lot of my, my viewpoint was coming from the, the desire for a, a certain type of revenge and, and, and of anger at having been abused and mistreated on all levels of the society. Because for someone like me, I had a, a kind of an acuity. So I could put together more of just what, what was going on. And I think that over years, talking to the, the, the greats of jazz, white and black, Jerry Mulligan has passed away, but he and I used to have very heated conversations about race. And he gave me the respect of his, the truth of his opinion. And it allowed us to get to a, a certain type of understanding, which was not just, I'm white, so I'm gonna be quiet and let you tell me how mad you are white folk. Um, when I teach my students, I'm very direct about racial things. 
And you know, I have I don't I don't really know Unique like I like I know you, Matias. So we we just actually met. I love him and respect his artistry, of course. But you know, you and I are talking now, and it's a public conversation. But I'm not talking to you any differently than I would have talked to you 20 years ago. So I don't I don't, I don't have to change yeah. really my attitude about it, and I don't. But I have to say that for my institution, I wrote a statement that when I put it out. The younger people who, who who I teach started calling me and saying, "Man, we don't this statement. You y'all need to redo this statement because I gave a, a universal kind of humanist statement that was not addressing the specific problem of the police violence in this instance." Now, these are kids that I taught. They're 28, 25, 22. Hey, I'm 58, and then my staff started to go berserk. They're writing and calling, "Man, this you got to take this statement down. You have to this. You have to that." For for older leader. You have to sit back and follow your young leadership. So at that time, mm. I, I went through the process of listening to what they were saying. We redid this statement and we put another statement up. The statement we put up doesn't it do, doesn't go uh, against the statement I had originally, but it's more specific. And I think for us, as you, as we get older, you, we have to adjust. We have to make space and we have to allow younger people to live lives too and be a part of the democratic process and and, and listen to what they say. And try to understand how, and even though nothing my younger people are saying goes against what I'm saying, it's a tone. I'm not on social media. So I, I don't know how people are reading things. And in this instance, it helped me to change, listen to my young leadership and make the changes. They made the changes that they wanted to see. And I was fine with that because of the trust and love I have for them that's been built up for many over years since they were 12 or 13 years old. Winton, you're always learning, and that's one of the inspirational things about you. I'm gonna, I'm sure, I'd, I'd love to hear Yannick's reaction to what you've what you've been saying. I'll just hand over to you, Yannick, in a second. But, you know, I know you say you're not on social media, but you put a really powerful statement um, out there on um, from from yourself, uh, which Yannick and I also included in our statement together, and and it was meaningful, powerful, and really helped orient our thinking. Um, Yannick, you're hearing this from Winston now. What, what's your in immediate reactions? I mean, the the change, you know, so many things, Winton, and what you're saying, you know, the change of how we care. Um, and I'm not talking only about the uh, us in the arts, but, you know, that's what we're talking about tonight. But the way we care for our institutions, which means the people in the institutions, the way we care for students, the way we care for the people we inspire. And I think you're right. There's actually, hopefully, I would like to say a generational change, although that also is not, you know, something to oppose, you know, no generation gap. But I would like to see that perhaps the younger people who come and see an orchestra like the Philadelphia Orchestra could feel that they are part of it and they are inspired. And I think that's a little bit the internal, uh, eternal question that we, you know, with Joseph Conyers, who you know is a wonderful part of our orchestra, we, we ask and we discuss together, how can we make sure, you know, to inspire and to say, there's a place for you, even though at the moment you don't recognize necessarily it's not your image that you see on the stage. Right. Yeah, it's important. And you know, it goes back, Yannick, Matthias and I sat down when he was at Berkeley and we were talking about how can we get black kids into this concert hall? And we had the conversation in a very basic way. So I'm going to talk basic now. That was, I don't know, yeah. four years ago. I don't, I don't even know, Matthias, yeah. three, four years ago. And it's a subject that we've talked about down through the years. Yeah, that because the orchestral music is such a great human heritage. And that music is separated into black music, white music, all these different things. As my father, he was always against that. You know, when, when I was all into it, he was like, nah, this, that, there's a heritage that we all share. We have our ethnic heritage and we have our human heritage. So when we get back to the business of orchestral music, let's let's bring people up to our level of culture. Let, let's not go down to a level of vulgarity that we've enjoyed in this country since the minstrel show. And black people are always called upon to put black face on and use nasty language and be a fool and make a fool out of ourselves. And the nation loves it and they support it. Everybody gets behind it. But the kind of elevatory aspect of culture, which is not just in classical music, of course, it's in many styles, but to, to remove the kind of association of the achievement of Beethoven with white or the achievement of Duke Ellington with black or the 
these people are on that level, they occupy rare air that is, that is a statement for human beings. And it does not mean we shouldn't discuss their ethnicity or, or whatever it is. Yeah, great to discuss that. But why we're still talking about Johann Bach is not because he's from Germany. It's because of the depth of his statement. And uh, I think that the orchestra can do a lot, but it has to do a lot with force. Joe and I also discussed that. I don't believe in dumbing down stuff and, and having our younger people come in here and give them a lower level of, of humanity under the guise of some type of ethnic program. They'll get it. They have a deep humanity and, and intelligence and unbelievable feeling. It's just a lot of times it's been beat out of them by all the negative imagery and the type of energy that's put into menstrual fool images, gangster images, all these things that don't that truly don't represent a mass of the people. Then that fake narrative creates a kind of a psychotic bubble of propaganda that allows you to continue hatred for a group of people. That stuff was always fake and false. And in this entire time, for me being out there, I've always been uh, uh, an unbelievable uh, uh, opponent of it. I know Joe is. I know Matias. I know you are unique. None of us, when we talk about it, are we fans of that. But we have to be more forceful in fighting against it. And I've often told my yeah. white trumpet players, I'm not, when you tell, like a lot of times, Younger uh, white musicians who've grown up with some type of privilege, one of their habits is they talk disrespectfully about their parents. I don't teach them and say, well, man, you know, that's a white thing. Y'all talk disrespectful about your parents, so I'm going to sit here as an adult and listen to it, and it's okay because I don't want to step on your ethnic thing. No. I say, man, I don't know if this is y'all's ethnic thing, but if your parents pay for you to be up here, you need to show some respect. I come from a place where a lot of people didn't have daddies or they struggle with their family life. So to be this disrespectful to a person you don't know, we have to start to check and balance people a certain way, not based on ethnicity. Winton, you know, it's all about the individual. It's all about the world and how you bring the two together is incredible. We, we have a question from Facebook that, I, that you've largely answered, but I do want to say it to the uh, say it out loud. Uh, it's from someone called Liz Marshall, who says, can you speak to the fears of orchestra management in diversifying programs, res programming resulting in lower ticket sales? And what can we do about the endemic racism among the cultural elite of Western classical music? Do we have to keep to tiptoe around racists to keep orchestras funded? That's a that's a stark question. I'm not sure I agree with all of it, but I think these are the kinds of questions that we are, we're facing. I think that if you could survive a lot of the music we play anyway, you could survive anybody's music. <laughs> no. I, sometimes I sit at the concert hall and I say to myself, mm. <laughs> you know, let's just be for real about it for a second. And another thing I want to dispel is the thought of who donates to stuff. I know sometimes I get statements about my donors and they say, oh, you know, they, they're telling you what to do this. I've been with my donors for 30 years. Some of them were civil rights workers. It, it, the, the dynamics are not the way we perceive them to be. Uh, that does not mean that there's not racism everywhere. There is. It's a part of our national story in, in terms of America. It is in our DNA and our identity. But the question is, there are quality pieces written by Black composers throughout history. And there are some that are OK. My thing about racism always is it doesn't show up at the highest level. It shows up with whoever is on the bench of your basketball team or who's not the stars of the football team, who's not your top employees, who's not. What about just the average person that's out here playing, trying to trying to trying to make it? You're not going to have an entire season of just the greatest pieces ever written. You have a lot of space and fat to program people's music, not during Black History Month. And I will guarantee you there won't be one single donor who will come back and say, oh, uh, Unique, uh, Matias, why did you program those Black people's music? What hurts is when it's programmed in one night of just one thing. Like, I always hate that. Black composers night or, or, or women's night. I, mm -hmm. I think that that type of segregated programming creates a greater feeling of segregation. And I think you will find that when you integrate things and you talk to your donors, donors are much more progressive. You may have a few staunch people who really want to pursue the, 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 the racist agenda, but in general, those people are not attracted to the arts because that message is the opposite of Bach, is the opposite of Beethoven, is the opposite of Shostakovich, the struggles of people in classical music. When you start to study the, the, the composers and what they read and what they said and what musicians have gone through to play music. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you may have to educate some of your donors, but in my experience dealing with donors, I, I had a meeting with my, with my board just the other day and I was talking about who our donors were. One of our principal donors' father escaped Nazism. 
So, and, and I wrote a piece for his father, and his father recently passed. But people, when people write in on a Facebook or something, they say, well, these, these white people are telling you what to do. This man is not telling me what to do. He wants to be a part of creating the better world that forced his father to flee and run for his life. And uh, it's a matter of communication and being direct and honest and also of programming good pieces. I don't know what you need. Do you? Oh, my God. I mean, that for me, I think what is consistent in your message is what I think we all truly believe, which is... Uh, you know, at every level, the small boxes, the uh, pigeonhole, the uh, what, you know, it feels like the human nature always wants to uh, to divide. We It feels like, you know, just for our own understanding, we want to always be able to classify everything. And so that comes from uh, just the way we do our schedules, the way we do our life, the way we do our routines, and it goes into something much more important than you know, you know, um, uh, than this, which is basically ethnicity, race, and that you're right that to correct something, uh, which I loved when you talked about the guided correction, you know, but it's not about counting, it's not about uh, equality, it's about correcting it over a certain time, but certainly not continue to segregate it for another reason. And I think I see this as the most inspiring message because um, I think there's a lot. I would love to see that after the moment we live now, and this is the question I'm asking myself at the moment, how can we do more and better in our institutions? But we must all resist this temptation to say, oh, we're gonna feature this and that, and yet segregate even more. And I think this has to be a much more inclusive and part of uh, a complete humanity uh, uh, concept. Uh, definitely. definitely. We need to get the two of you together on public platforms speaking uh, more about this because there is a resonance happening here that we need to amplify. Um, your musical souls are clearly intertwined. Winton, I love you. You're a dear friend. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hey, thank you. Your words are so meaningful. Hey, it's such a pleasure thank to you, be Winton. here. Much, much love and respect. We gotta handle our business. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's what, I love. I love. That's what, I love the orchestra and the institution. You know. So it's, it's, and, give my love to the orchestra. I, I just love Philly Orchestra. Great. We I love, love Philadelphia you. Orchestra. We love you. you. All right. Such a pleasure.